This is our fifth week now into this social social distancing. And we've been doing a, a series kind of in light of this. It was a series I had planned to do anyways in the next few months. But it was about recovery dangers. And what I realized as COVID-19 came along is that it was putting people in recovery into a lot of dangers. So pretty much every topic that I was going to cover about dangers that people face in recovery was coming up because of this COVID-19. And so tonight we're going to be coming to a dangerous place for people in recovery is when they go through a significant change, a big change. And that's what COVID-19 has brought is a whole bunch of changes that have been very difficult for people. So let me just give you beyond COVID-19 some of the changes that cause people in recovery a lot of trouble. So Basically, it's any time their routine changes in a big way. So you can think of somebody that's been in a treatment program where every morning they got to be up at a certain time, be at class at a certain time. Their day is planned for them, basically. And then they finish the program, they graduate, and now they don't have to get out of bed in the morning. They don't have to do assignments or anything. So there's a huge change in their routine. Very difficult for a lot of people. For others, just going on vacation can be a, a real big change of routine that they weren't expecting that it really messed them up. So anything that changes your routine in a significant way is quite difficult for people coming out of complex trauma. So another big change is people going back to work. So they've been off work, they've been in programs, but now they're going back to work and that messes up people in a big way. Or people who've had a job and been going to work every day and then all of a sudden they lose their job, they get laid off, <clears throat> and that changes their routine in a big way. Another, probably one of the biggest ones, is a lot of people come into recovery without their children. They've been taking, taken away from them due to their using and now they work so hard to get their children back and they get them back and they don't plan for or realize how big of a change that is and how it is going to mess it up, mess them up. And sadly for many, they've been working so hard to get their children back. Once they get their children back, it really messes them up and they relapse and lose their children again. Another big change type of event would be moving to a new city where you don't know people or you might, but it's just all brand new environment and it's a huge thing that messes people up. The next one, which I would say is one of the bigger ones, is when people who've been single in recovery up to now get in a relationship or they've been in a relationship and now they, have, they move in together. And that typically messes people up big time. Another one is having a child. Um, all of a sudden, all of the change that that requires, how it throws your whole lifestyle, routine, it just throws it crazy, and it, a lot of people aren't prepared for that. Another one is some type of traumatic event. So an illness, an accident, all of those types of things, or s losing somebody. So somebody close to you dies, or you lose something, an event, some type of institution, some type of activity that was very important to you, you're no longer able to do it, it closes down or whatever. And then an illness is a change that does a really affects people, but they don't even realize until they're actually in it how much it can mess with them. So those are some of the changes that are, I would classify as big changes, changes that I have seen in the people that I work with that really put them into a vulnerable, dangerous position. Now that leads to a question, why? Why is change such a difficult thing for people in recovery, people from complex trauma. A number of reasons. When any change comes, so just take, for example, you get your children back or you go back to work. 
all of a sudden, your priorities in your life can change without you even realizing it. Think of getting into a relationship. So up till now, you've been single, and your priorities have been, I have to be recovery, because if I don't have my recovery, if I relapse, I lose everything. So what do I need to do for my recovery? I need to have these priorities in my life. A connection with God, going to recovery meetings, being involved in counseling, that is a priority. Then you fall in love or you get your kids back or you go back to work and then all of a sudden you don't have as much time to do those priorities or now the new girlfriend or spending time with your kids becomes more important than your recovery and everything gets pushed down your priority list that used to be number one and two is now four and five, and all of a sudden your priorities change. Then that whole, you don't have as much time. So people that are in recovery, they are saying, I have to devote this amount of time every week to recovery, and now They are back to work or they have their kids back and they're spending all kinds of time every day, eight hours a day at work, etc. And they just go, I'm too tired to go to a meeting. I'm too tired to contact somebody and they just do not have the time. And then there's another piece to change that is very difficult for people. And that is when you are in your existing routine, your existing situation in life, you have what you would have as your rocks. The things that you lean on, the things that are there for you, the things that bring stability to your life, the things that cause you to feel secure and safe and know that if you're having a, tr- a struggle, you can go to that person or that thing and get the support you need. But when life changes in big ways, all of a sudden, you can lose some of those rocks. They're not there for you anymore because you've moved or they've moved or whatever. And so now when you go through a change, the very things that provided you with security and stability aren't there for you. And you can feel all up in the air. You can feel very insecure and it can be a very scary time. Another part to change that is very difficult for people is that change introduces unknowns. So you can prepare for a lot of change, but you might not be able to see every possible scenario that will happen because of that change. And because of that, now when the change takes place, you enter into stuff you didn't see coming, stuff that blindsides you and a bunch of unknowns. And so what happens to a lot of people when they look at change, it brings in their fear of the unknown, because if there's something that they're not prepared for, they might get hurt again or they might fail. And then, because of that, what happens in our brain whenever we go through change, if we come from complex trauma, is our sensitivity is heightened. We are now more alert to danger. We are on guard even more. And without realizing it, we go into our limbic brain because of the heightened possibility of danger. And we don't even realize we're back in our limbic brain, but that can be a very dangerous place for people. There's one other piece to going through a big change. Changes, even if they're good, usually mean we lose something. So every time a change happens, we lose something from the old way it used to be. And the greater the change, the greater the losses usually. And so for people going through change, often without them being aware of it, there's some subconscious grieving that takes place over some of the things they had to give up or that they lost because of that change. And that can do wreak havoc in them, either in their mental health or create a depression and a sadness because of that. I want to read to you a couple of things about change. So in relationship to loss, there's a psychotherapist by the name of Heidi McBain, and she's written this. Grief and loss can often be found at the heart of major life changes, especially ones that we have little or no, no control over. This can lead to a lot of mental health issues, but the big ones 
are typically depression and or anxiety. Dr. Srini Pillay, he's an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medi Medical School, and he's written this, when you change, it actually activates the conflict sensors in the brain. In other words, every change triggers your brain and it triggers the conflict parts of your brain. And this causes brain chaos that we call dissonance. So what, what he means by the cognitive dissonance and all of that is that when you go through a change, your brain doesn't like it. It goes to the conflict areas and all of a sudden there's this stuff, this dissonance going on in the brain because the brain is uncomfortable. This activation of the conflict sensor becomes stressful to people. So now change e equals stress, added stress. Even change that's generally positive registers in the brain the same way as a more difficult event. So he's saying, doesn't matter if the change is good, positive, or the change is bad, negative. Both register exactly the same in the brain. And it can induce anxiety or uncertainty or a feeling of unfamiliarity. And this generally precipitates habit pathways in the brain. Meaning, as soon as you feel stress, you want to go back to old habits. The brain feels more comfortable with old patterns. All of that to say this, whenever you go through change, your brain doesn't like it, it gets uncomfortable, and its first response is to go to the oldest familiar habits for dealing with stress and discomfort. And for people from complex trauma, that means going back to old ways of coping that aren't healthy. And if you've got addiction in the history, your brain starts exploring addiction as the best way to cope with a major change. So major change is a big, big danger area. Now I want to bring in just a little bit more about the complex trauma connection to why big change is such a dangerous thing. So we talked about the fact that change triggers fear. And for people from complex trauma, it triggers fear in a big way. Fear of the unknown. Let me read again from Dr. Pillay. He says this, A study showed that in people who are uncertain, so they're going through a time of change, 75% of the people mispredict when bad things are going to happen. In other words, what he is saying is this, when people from complex trauma come to a, to a time of change, their brains start predicting the future. And their prediction, 75% of the time, is something bad's going to happen. They predict bad things. So the uncertainty biases the brain to expect the worst. This doesn't mean that change is great and that you should expect the best every time, but you should recognize that your brain will go into an automatic negativity bias. In other words, when you go through change, your brain, if you're from complex trauma, jumps to worst case scenario very easily. And that is not good because that then adds stress, that adds that fear of the unknown, that adds all kinds of limbic brain feelings that cause you to want to go to fight, flight, or freeze. Very dangerous. There's another thing that happens with complex trauma. So the design in a healthy child growing up in a healthy family is that when they go through change and they feel the anxiety and the stress and the fear that something bad might happen, they have mom and dad to go to as a rock. And mom and dad calm them down, assure them, help them through it, and they begin to realize that change isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I got through it because I had a rock. In complex trauma, that rock wasn't usually there. And so the child had to depend on themselves or reach out to friends and let them be a rock. But the inclination whenever there's change is there's still something in me 
that has a compulsion to seek out a rock in a time of insecurity. And what can happen for people from complex trauma when they go through a, a change in recovery and they haven't yet got healthy rocks in their life is that they go back to the old rocks, old friends, old ex-relationships, and they get involved again with those people because something in them is seeking security. And that can be very dangerous. Another thing with going through change is it can trigger depression in people from complex trauma. It adds to the stress enough that it affects the mental health, and so depression and anxiety can be there. Another thing that can happen when a big change takes place for somebody from complex trauma is it can take them to a place of this is chaos again. And without realizing it, it triggers that part of them that loves and hates chaos at the same time. And all of a sudden, they just want to keep the chaos happening because it makes them have a distraction from what they're going through. And so they can begin to seek out even more chaos outside of the change that they're presently going through. Two other things that can happen. Number one is people going through a big change, feeling the stress, feeling the fear, feeling the anxiety, the depression. They can go to self-pity. And they can start just to feel sorry for themselves. And that's a very dangerous place. And some finally can go to anger. And they can just get mad at the change, mad at the loss of the rocks in their life, all of that. And they become very angry and they find that it also medicates some of the fear that they're feeling so they like the anger. So Dr. Elizabeth Medlock wrote this. If you spend too much time in that place of anger or pity, self-pity or blame, you end up not being able to adapt to your change. It keeps you in a place of helplessness. So she's saying the longer you stay in anger and self-pity and blaming everybody for what you're going through, you stay helpless. You're not able to change with the change. You're not able to adapt to it and get into a healthy place. So anger and self-pity, they're part of what people might go through, but don't stay there too long because it will keep you stuck in a very dangerous place. I found a very interesting and in researching change and its effect on people that psychiatrists have come up with a category that they now call adjustment disorders. And what it means is they've come up with a category about people who have trouble adjusting to change. And that's basically complex trauma people. And they said there's six types of adjustment disorders. So I'm going to go through them quickly you might find that they describe you. And I'm not trying to stick anybody in a box. I just think it adds some extra insight into the fact that people from complex trauma have trouble with adjusting to change. So the first adjustment disorder is called adjustment disorder with a depressed mood. And so a person, what they're saying is a person goes through adjustment and that triggers depression. They then, after the change... They go into a depressed state. And so they just feel sad. They feel hopeless about everything. They don't enjoy anything. They cry a lot. So that's number one. Number two is they go through a change, struggle with the adjustment, and go to anxiety. And so now they're afraid of everything. They feel overwhelmed. And they, they just are on guard all the time. They worry. They have all kinds of anxiety issues happening. For children going through that, they can go through times where just they're going through a change and then they have to leave their parents for a little bit and that creates even extra anxiety. So anxiety. Third one is you go through a change and you struggle with it and it takes you to both depression and anxiety. Fourth one, and this one is quite interesting. It's called with disturbance of conduct. So you go through a change and 
something changes in your behavior. You're not dealing well with a change. And so here's some of the symptoms. Behavioral problems such as you've you fight all the time now. You pick fights. You're always getting angry. You're quick to fight back. Or you just rebel against everything. You, you're antagonistic. You dig in your heels when anybody suggests anything. Some go to, they become very irresponsible. They don't want to do anything. They don't follow through on appointments, on responsibilities. Some go to lying. Some become very angry and hostile and lash out all the time. Some become very impulsive and lack inhibitions. So they just do a whole bunch of things on impulse that aren't very wise. And the final disturbance of conduct thing is they become reckless in their behavior. They be begin taking risks, driving dangerously, other types of risks, all because they're not dealing well with change. And you might relate to some of those. And then the fifth one is called with mixed disturbance of emotions and conduct. So that one would be you have depression, anxiety, and you act out. And then the sixth one is called unspecified. You have trouble, you have changes in behavior, just doesn't fit the rest. So all of those things can come out of complex trauma and they are now referred to as adjustment disorders. So having said that, what are some tools to help us get through times of change? So let me give you a parallel that might help you just think this through. I remember when I graduated out of university, I moved to a city to take a job there and I only knew a couple people there, but I really didn't know anybody. I wasn't close to anybody. And what I realized, thankfully, is that that was going to be a dangerous time for me to move to a brand new city, brand new time of my life, taking on a new job. I needed to go in there prepared. I needed to think through this change because I knew if I got into that change and I started making some bad decisions it was going to be even more dangerous for me. I was going to be in big trouble in a hurry. And so what it forced me to do was to think through a whole bunch of things. And that's what I want to give you to, for, for, uh, right now. But before I get into that, let me just say this. It takes our brain a little while to adjust to a change. Even the most healthy people know that when they go through a change, it's going to take them a couple weeks to figure out how to live healthy within that new change. So you have to be patient with yourself. So going through a change, don't expect that you're going to have it all figured out on the first day. Give yourself a couple weeks to learn to figure out what you need to do in order to get healthy. Okay. Secondly, the first thing that I realized when I moved to a new city was... I needed to be on guard against falling into any old habits. And so every person has kind of their habits that aren't healthy that their brain wants to go to when they're struggling. And so I had to think through, okay, what are, where are the areas where I am most vulnerable that my brain is going to want to go to? I need to guard against falling into those. Because if I fall into those even for one day, I could be in big trouble. Because as soon as I feed that monster, it's going to come back with greater power, wanting to be fed even more. So what I had to do was I sat down and I said, what are the priorities of my life? What are the top things in my life that if they're not in place, nothing else good is going to happen? And so I had to sit down and figure out what my priorities were if I was going to be healthy, what those priorities translated into as far as what do I need to do every day in order to be healthy. Okay, so now going to a new city, those things have to be in my life. So what can happen when we go through change is we can get distracted by all kinds of things within the new change. And we can start to lose touch 
with what's important for being healthy. So sit down and figure out what are the most important things I have to have in my life if I have any chance of being healthy, of doing the right things. So once you do that, then plan your days, plan your weeks out so that you make sure you have the right kind of activities in your life. And that will usually involve a variety of activities. So you're going to do things to stay connected to people. You're going to do things to stay spiritually connected. You're going to do things to keep track of how you're doing, being self-aware physically, emotionally, so that what do I need in my life to be physically fit, spiritually fit, connected to others, on top of my emotions, dealing with problems, all of that becomes very important. Now understand this. If you go into a change and you don't plan, yes, you'll get distracted for a while, but then you'll get bored. And once you get bored, that will be a new stress on your brain that will make it want to go back to old habits even more. So to not plan is usually, in these cases, to actually plan to fail. So planning becomes important. I have found this in my own life. When I'm in a vulnerable situation, I need to be extra vigilant because I'm in greater danger. So change is one of those times of greater danger, and so it calls for extra vigilance, extra planning, extra self-discipline, accountability, connection, all of those things become extra important. Think of it this way. If you've ever ridden a horse where you've been hanging on to the reins and you steer the horse, if you're out in an open field, you kind of let the reins go relax. You give the horse its head, is what they say. And the horse can kind of go off in whatever direction it wants. It's not a big deal. But when you get to a narrow path, you grab those reins and you hold them tight and you don't give the horse its head because you're in dangerous territory. That's the same with us. When we enter dangerous territory, we got to tighten the reins on ourselves so that we don't put ourselves in greater danger. The next thing that I realized is I needed a plan and I planned out each day of my week I planned out what I needed to do each day to keep the priorities happening so that I stayed healthy. One of the things that was part of that plan was connecting to people. And so that meant for me going to a new city, I had to connect still with my existing rocks from the previous city, but I had to start building new relationships so that I could find a group of one or two or three healthy people so that I could begin to get <clears throat> new connection and good relationships. Next thing to be on guard when you go through change is that desire to seek out a rock in the sense of falling into a romantic relationship. Really guard against that because you're extra vulnerable in times of change into following, falling into that. The final thing is this. I read some research that I found fascinating. And it said when you go through times of change, there's part of you that needs to be super focused. You need to tighten those reins. You can't not be vigilant. And you got to problem solve. And you got to work out new things. And you got to be on task. And our tendency is to go into overdrive, to drive ourselves to think 24-7, trying to anticipate every problem, etc. What they have found is our brain every day needs time to relax. It needs a break. And what they also found is that when our brain relaxes for a while, it actually can process stuff better than if we stay tense and focused and strict and intense all the time. And so we need times where that brain can just take a break. But what it's doing is it's not totally taking a break. It's still processing, 
but it's processing stuff we had never processed if we were still in tents. And as I thought about that, I realized, yeah, that's, I've gone through that experience in my own life. I've gone through times where I've been super focused and I've worked through a whole bunch of things, but when I've gone home that day and I've turned on the TV and watched something, all of a sudden my, I realize my brain is processing stuff and I get great insights into stuff. So still try to keep some balance, some focus and intensity, but still some time just to relax a little bit. So sad to say, COVID-19 for most people has introduced a whole bunch of changes that you didn't see coming, you weren't prepared for, and some of them you're not liking at all. You're out of your routine, you might have kids underfoot all day long, and that's driving you crazy. You can't connect with some of your friends like you used to. And so you're finding this change to be extremely difficult. I hope that what we've shared tonight will just give you some insight and give you some tools that will help you on this journey and help you to deal with these change in a healthy way. So that's the end of part one. I'm going to take a one minute break and then we'll come back for the Christian part. Okay, welcome back for Welcome back for the Christian part and we're almost done this series on following Israel after they came out of slavery in Egypt and we've been focusing on the fact that during that four generations of Jewish people living in slavery they went through four generations of complex trauma and in their behavior, once they get out of slavery, we begin to see the characteristics of complex trauma being lived out in their life. And they were like many people that I deal with. They thought that the slavery was their problem and that after they're out of slavery, their life would be great. But what they realize is after they're out of the slavery, now they had to deal with the real problem, which was their self. The complex trauma of slavery had changed them. In order to survive that trauma, their coping skills now made healthy life impossible. And so they became their own worst enemies. So we've been watching the things that God did to help them begin to face the problems in themselves, to help them change and get through that. And so tonight I want to back away from a specific event that took place and give you a big picture of what was happening gradually over the time after they left slavery. So what we saw is that in the first year after they left slavery, they went from Egypt to Mount Sinai and they spent a lot of time there. God gave them the Ten Commandments, gave them a new religion, a place to worship the tabernacle. They got set into this new life with new rules, new government. All of those things were developing. After a year, he then took them on to the promised land where they went through um, getting ready to conquer that land. But we saw some problems took place there. They got to the edge of the land. They sent in 12 spies. And the 12 spies came back. And two said, let's go in. Let's take it. God's promised it. Ten said, no, no, there's giants there. It's fortified cities. We can't. And they talked all of Israel into not wanting to go into the land God promised. 
And that's what we looked at last week. So what I want to look at tonight is what was happening gradually to the relationships of the people with Moses over that two-year period. And what we're going to see is a sad story. And part of why I want you to think about this with me is this. A lot of people with complex trauma, they get into relationships and they fail, but they don't want to admit that they're the problem. They want to say that person, if they were different, then this relationship would work. And so then they become parents and they lash out at their kids, they do things at their kids, and they don't want to face that. And so they'll use all kinds of rationalization. Oh, my complex trauma only affects me, doesn't affect anybody else's. I don't need to deal with it. I don't need to look at it. That's their problem if they don't like it. And they do all kinds of different things to avoid looking honestly at how their complex trauma is affecting the close relationships of their life. And that's what this big picture that I want to give you tonight will help us to look at and understand. So I want to begin by s s looking at something we're told about Moses. In chapter 12 of Numbers, it says, Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. In other words, Moses was the most humble man in the world. That's a good thing. Because all positive character comes out of humility. And so what it is saying is Moses was the most wonderful, mature, God-like man in existence. You would have a lot of trouble finding flaws in Moses' character. You would have a lot of trouble finding fault with stuff that Moses did because of his deep humility and the character that came out of that deep humility. Okay, so remember that. Moses is in a relationship with all these complex trauma people. He is the most mature, wonderful man in the entire world. Now watch what happens with the people of Israel in their relationship. So go back to Exodus 16. They've been out of slavery for two days. And after two days, they're thirsty and they want water. And it says this, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted, but now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Instead of admitting their fear, instead of being honest about the situation, they complained about Moses. They lashed out at Moses. And so what we then have seen over the last number of weeks as we've taught through this is this pattern continually repeated themselves. They would go along great in life until something happened where they didn't feel their needs were being met. They didn't have the food they wanted. They didn't have the comforts they wanted. They didn't have water at a certain time. And whenever that happened, it would trigger their complex trauma. And then they would jump to the worst case scenario. We're going to die out here. God brought us out here to die. And instead of trusting God to meet that need, they would lash out at God and at Moses. And they would blame God and they would blame Moses for their problems. And they would think their old life was better than what they were going through today. And we've watched them go through that pattern over and over again. So let's move forward in the tape to the events that we now come to as they sit at the edge of the promised land when they're getting the spies to go into the promised land. So it says the spies have come back while they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? So something very interesting here is happening. Every time they went through that, pro that cycle of being in trouble, lashing out at Moses instead of trusting God, blaming God, blaming Moses, jumping to the worst case scenario, every time they went through that, they began to respect Moses a little less each time. Now that disrespect of Moses is spreading. 
and now his own brother and sister, those closest to him, are now turning against him. They're developing a disrespectful attitude towards him as well. And then it says this, after the spies have given the report of the land, the whole community began weeping aloud. They cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Then they plotted amongst themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. So now this is where their disrespect or their lack of respect or their growing lack of respect has brought them. We got to get rid of this guy. Now remember, he's the healthiest guy in the world. And then in chapter 16, just a little bit later, one day Korah conspired with Dathan and Abiram. They incited a rebellion against Moses along with 250 other leaders of the community, all prominent members of the assembly, they said, you have gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord, and he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? So this has come to a huge crisis. Over a two-year period, they have gone from respecting Moses, seeing all of his great strength and his great character, to now they're all of the leaders of Israel are banding together, confronting Moses, saying, who do you think you are? You're no better than any of us. We want to get rid of you. And so they are planning a coup. And God stopped that coup and a bunch of people died that day because of it. And God validated that Moses was his choice, but the damage had been done. So let me get you to think about this. Do you realize that when you're in a relationship with somebody and you don't deal with your complex trauma, every time you have a fight, you're going to blame them, lash out at them, but your respect for them is going to drop. So they're going to go down a little bit in your eyes. The next time you have a fight and you haven't dealt with your complex trauma, you are going to blame them, lash out at them, and their respect, your respect for them is going to drop. And that's going to keep going until eventually you can't think of one positive thing to say about them. Now, they might have their own issues. That's not the point. You need to look at those issues. What I want you to see is what has happened to your respect for people if you don't deal with your complex trauma. So if you don't deal with your complex trauma, every relationship, even with healthy people, in your eyes, those people will continue to lose respect. And it's really because you haven't dealt with your stuff. So let me put it this way. What was the real issue for the people of Israel? They wanted to say it was Moses, that he was a bad leader. What was the real issue? Their fear. Their fear of the unknown. Their fear of taking a risk and trusting God. What would have been the solution to their fear? Trusting God. God had promised. God had proved that he could take care of them. God had promised to give them the promised land. God had overcome the greatest, most powerful nation in the world, Egypt, to bring them deliverance. He could handle any enemy in their future. That was all very clear. If they would just trust, then it would solve everything. But they refused to trust and they refused to admit their fear and it was their issues that was causing them to become angry and lash out every time their trauma got triggered. And so because of that, they ended up seeing the most wonderful man in the world as a man who they should get rid of as being a terrible, terrible person. So what I want you to hear in all of this is a very important point. I am not saying if you're in a relationship, 
you shouldn't honestly look at the other person. And if they've got a whole bunch of flaws that are deal breakers, you should get rid of them. Okay? Don't misunderstand me there. But what I want you to understand is this. If you don't deal with your complex trauma, it will eventually cause you to lose respect for even the most wonderful people in your life and you will get rid of all the good people. More than that, it will take a relationship which might be between two people who got their issues, but they're both working on it. But if you don't deal with your stuff the way you should, you're eventually going to destroy that relationship. And it's going to mess up your relationship with your children. So the story of Israel, loud and clear, brings into focus what happens to relationships when people don't deal with their stuff. And then I want to end with this. What is the beginning place for dealing with our stuff? It's what the people of Israel went through when God first brought them out of slavery in Egypt. The first thing God did was put them into a situation where they had to trust him. And they did not like that. They got mad. But he was saying, you can't grow and heal unless you learn to trust. And that's the hardest thing for a person who's been hurt by everybody in their life. To trust somebody again is a scary risk. And so what I want you to hear is this. If you're seeing your complex trauma, and if you see that when it gets triggered, you lash out and blame people and get angry at people and hurt those around you, you have to begin by saying, I have to take the risk of trusting God with my life, turning my will and my life over to him. I have to take the risk of trusting some people because if I don't, I will never heal and I'll destroy all my relationships. So I hope that gives you a sobering reality check and motivates you to keep working on yourself. Let's pray. Father, we all need to be reminded of the dangers that we face when we don't deal with our stuff and the damage that it does. And Lord, for some, the damage can be so great in our children that they may never recover from it. But I thank you for most kids that they do want to heal the relationship with parents who have hurt them. And so I just pray that you would motivate each person and help them to continue to work on themselves. Amen. Well, that's the end of our Friday night. And thank you again for being part of this with us. And we'll see you next Friday.